Hello, good morning, and welcome to AMSA's webinar titled Supporting Clients with Disabilities. My name is Sabrina Ziegler, and I am AMSA Settlement Coordinator, and I will be guiding us through today's webinar. I'm being accompanied today by Julie Shipp, AMSA's Acting Language Coordinator, who we will hear from later in the course of the webinar, as well as Connor Rasland, our AV Coordinator, who will be assisting us with all technical aspects of today's event. Before we get started, we would like to thank Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, IRCC, for funding today's event. So today's webinar, we will have three different presentations by content experts. Um, our presenters today are going to be Karen Williams from the Social Policy and Research Council of British Columbia, Spark, BC, Sam Turcott from Disability Alliance, British Columbia, as well as Julie Shipp and myself, Sabrina Ziegler, we will, we will be um, taking some of the content um, that we will be discussing and relating it back to the link and settlement programming. At, at the end of the webinar, we will have a dedicated time for Q&A. So I would like to introduce the first speaker for today's event, and that is Karen Williams, the Manager of Accessibility Initiatives at Spark BC, which is a Social Policy and Research Council of British Columbia. Karen holds a master's degree in urban and regional planning from Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario, and is a certified member of the Planning Institute of BC and the Canadian Institute of Planners. Karen first joined Spark BC in 2007 as a member of the research and consulting team and has worked as a manager of accessibility initiatives since 2013. Thank you so much, Sabrina, for the lovely introduction. I'd also like to thank AMSA for organizing this event, and thanks to all of you for participating in the event today. I think it's wonderful, uh, since you all play such a key role in welcoming people with disabilities to Canada, that you've taken the time to participate and learn more about the best way of doing that. To start, um, this slide provides an outline of the various topics that we're going to cover today as part of this presentation. First, I will share some information on the overall webinar goals, definitions of disability, and will provide an introduction to some common types of disabilities. Next, we will build on this foundation by exploring some of the common disability myths, as well as some of the types of barriers people with disabilities experience. This will be followed by some helpful tips and guidelines to follow around disability-friendly communication and people-first language. Finally, we will close this presentation with some information about the Canadian context around disability issues and Canadian values around including people with disabilities. There are three main goals for this webinar presentation. The first goal is to increase understanding of disabilities and disability issues. The second goal is to increase understanding about appropriate ways of communicating with people with disabilities. And the third goal is to learn how to communicate or serve clients with disabilities more effectively. You'll see at the bottom of this slide that I've also included a cartoon created by an artist with a disability who lives in the UK. As you can see, the cartoon shows a man who is blind. Uh, he is seated in a reception area with his guide dog and white cane. He's sitting right beside a large posted sign which reads, all blind visitors, please report to the other reception. A receptionist comes up to greet him with a clipboard and complains. We just as well may, may not have bothered with this sign for all the notice that you people take of it. And the man's just sitting there dumbfounded and speechless, not believing what he's hearing from this receptionist. As you know, this would be an example of bad customer service uh, because, of course, most people who are blind would not be able to read a large posted sign like this. Throughout the presentation, I've included a bunch of different cartoons from Crippen. The artist's real name is Dave Lupton, but he often goes by an alter ego, Crippen. I love his work because it's both hilarious and informative. Reading Crippen cartoons can be a fun way to educate yourself about disability issues and the types of barriers experienced by people with disabilities. This next slide explores definitions of disability. There are a lot of different definitions of disability out there, and I've included a couple of examples. One is from the Canadian Disability Survey, while the other is from the United Nations. According to the Canadian Disability Survey, people have a disability if they have an activity limitation which limits the amount or kinds of activities that they can do due to a physical or mental condition or health problem. The United Nations definition is a little bit more nuanced because it recognizes how disability can be a subjective term and the types of societies that we live in can impact whether or not people feel disabled. According to the United Nations definition, 
The term people with disabilities is used to apply to all persons with disabilities, including those who have physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with various attitudinal and environmental barriers, hinders their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. It's important to know that a person with a disability may be regarded as a person with a disability in one society or setting, but not in another, depending on the role that that person is assumed to take in his or her community. The perception and the reality of disability also depends on the technologies, assistance available, as well as on cultural considerations. To, to provide an example, if someone has an eye condition and lives in a country where they have access to good medical care and good assistive technology, they may not feel like they're that disabled because they can do most things that they want to and don't have to think about their disability that much. In comparison, a person who lives in a country where they do not have access to good medical care and do not have access to the right supports, they may have more difficulties in everyday activities and feel more disabled. So this next slide explores uh, the prevalence of disability across BC. Across BC, there were approximately 546,760 residents over the age of 15 who reported a disability in the 2012 Canadian Disability Survey. Some people were born with their disabilities. Well, some other types of disabilities are acquired later in life. The likelihood of a person having a disability tends to increase with age. For example, one in 10 BC residents between the ages of 15 and 64 years have a disability. In comparison, over one in three older adults over the age of 65 have a disability. And this next slide um, explores the difference between invisible and visible disabilities. One thing to consider is that you might not necessarily be aware of someone's disability when you first meet them. Often when people first think of people with disabilities, they tend to think of more visible disabilities, such as people who use mobility aids, um, such as wheelchairs or walkers, or individuals with an obvious physical difference, such as a missing limb. However, there are a lot of disabilities out there that can be considered invisible or hidden disabilities. These are disabilities that can be invisible unless the person with the disability lets you know that they have a disability themselves. Some examples include people who are hard of hearing and are people who are partially sighted. Also, you won't necessarily be aware if someone has a mental health condition or a learning disability. Hidden disabilities can sometimes lead to misunderstandings in certain contexts. For example, uh, some people with learning disabilities in a classroom setting may be misunderstood by their classmates or by their teacher as being someone who's lazy or disorganized, when in fact, they're actually a person with a learning disability that may do better if they were taught in a slightly different way. This next slide um, shows the prevalence of different types of disabilities in Canada. As you can see, some of the main disability groups are people with physical disabilities. Um, this includes people with conditions like arthritis, back pain, and spinal cord injuries. Other major groups' disabilities include people with mental illnesses, such as anxiety disorders and depression, as well as people who have difficulty seeing and hearing, and people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities. The left column of this chart lists the different types of disabilities well, the middle column provides information on the types of activity limitations experienced by different groups. And the right column lists what percentage of the Canadian population reports that type of disability. Within the category of people with physical disabilities, approximately one in 10 Canadians reported that pain such as arthritis or back pain limits the amount and types of activities that they can do. Approximately 8% of Canadians reported that they have challenges with flexibility and have a difficult time bending down to pick up items or reaching for things. Approximately 7% have a mobility disability that limits their ability to walk and or take the stairs. And about 3.5% of Canadians have challenges with dexterity, which means they find it difficult to grasp small objects with their fingers. Across Canada, approximately 3.9% of the population reported mental health issues like anxiety or depression. Approximately 3% have difficulties hearing and are deaf or hard of hearing. Approximately 3% have difficulty seeing and are blind or partially sighted. Somewhere between 2 to 3% have intellectual or cognitive disabilities, including people with memory difficulties and learning difficulties. 
and about 0.6% of the population is born with a developmental disability. So this next slide explores overcoming myths or fears. One of the first steps to learning how to best serve people with disabilities is to learn more about some of the common myths and misperceptions that people have about people with disabilities. It's valuable to recognize that we may have inaccurate or insufficient information about people with disabilities in our communities. If left unchecked, myths and misconceptions can unintentionally perpetuate inappropriate actions and interactions because our beliefs guide how we view and ultimately how we treat people with disabilities. It's also important to note that we may fear what we don't know or what we don't understand. So there's a lot of myths out there, um, and this next slide shows a few examples. Myth number one, people with disabilities are brave, inspirational, and courageous. This myth can come up quite often because of how people with disabilities are portrayed in the media and in popular culture. However, most people with disabilities are just people like everyone else. Some are brave, some are not. Living with a disability more often requires the ability to adapt to one's circumstances rather than bravery or courage. Most people with disabilities consider their disability to be just one aspect of their life, but it's not the most defining aspect of their life and who they are as a person. Myth number two, people with disabilities need help all of the time. This is simply not true. People with disabilities often lead very independent lives and are capable of helping others. It's best to assume they don't need your help unless they ask for it. Uh, this Crippen cartoon on the bottom left makes fun of this myth. Uh, it shows a man standing and holding a book reading how to cope with people who use wheelchairs. Well, at the same time, another person is seated in a wheelchair and reading a book that says how to cope with people who read books about how to cope with people who use wheelchairs. There are probably a few different ways that you could interpret this cartoon. But one thing that stands out to me is that you can actually make other people's lives more tedious or difficult if you start to make too many assumptions about them and their needs and whether or not they need help in a particular situation. Myth number three, people with disabilities are special and should be treated differently. The truth is that people with disabilities are people just like everyone else. They go to school, get married, work, have families, do laundry, grocery shop, laugh, cry, pay taxes, get angry, have prejudice, vote and plan, fall in love and dream just like everyone else. It's best to treat a person with a disability just like you would treat any other person first and foremost. Myth number four, people with disabilities need sympathy. People with disabilities do not need sympathy or pity. They also don't need to be told that they are brave or courageous for living with a disability. Some people with disabilities are brave, some are not, just like everyone else. People with disabilities do not need to be treated like children. Rather, they need opportunities to maximize their independence. Myth number five, people with physical disabilities also have an intellectual disability. Just because someone has a physical disability doesn't mean that they also have an intellectual disability. And just because someone has difficulty speaking to you doesn't mean that they have difficulties understanding what you have to say. It can be really frustrating for someone who has a physical disability, who has above average intelligence to be constantly spoken down to like they are not intelligent or like they're a child. Uh, there's another Crippen cartoon below that pokes fun at this myth. It's the one that shows a person seated in a wheelchair as a specimen at what looks like some sort of science exhibit. He is surrounded by a glass case and a bunch of scientists in lab coats. One of the scientists says, you know, sometimes I think he understands everything we say. This cartoon is making fun of the assumption that people using wheelchairs aren't intelligent people of capable of following the conversations that surround them. On to myth number six. All disabilities are obvious. The main thing to remember is that there are a lot of hidden invisible disabilities out there, such as learning disabilities and mental illnesses. They can potentially make it difficult for clients to access services. They may choose to disclose their disability to you or not. Don't assume that you need to know if someone has a disability or that you will necessarily find out. Myth number seven, all people with disabilities are the same. People with disabilities are individual people and no two individuals are the same. Similarly, 
Not all people with disabilities are the same. For example, two people with the same type of disability can have very different needs and abilities. Even if you know someone else with the same type of disability, don't assume that you know what a person can do or how they think or how they feel or how they act. This Crippen cartoon on the bottom left makes fun of this assumption that all disabilities are the same. It shows two gentlemen using wheelchairs who are participating in an accessibility audit of an arts venue. They are just outside the building, which has two steps by the main entrance. One guy is a very muscular Paralympian using a manual wheelchair. He looks so strong, like he could just bench press the other two people in the cartoon. And he says to the person who's taking notes for the accessibility audit, oh, a few small steps aren't a problem for us disabled. Meanwhile, there's another gentleman sitting beside him in a power wheelchair who's looking completely shocked at what that guy just said. He's about to interrupt because he knows that he wouldn't be able to handle those two steps himself. It can be misleading to assume that something isn't a barrier just because you know one person with a disability who can find a way around it. Myth number eight, a disability defines who they are as an individual. People with disabilities are just people like everyone else and do regular people things like everyone else. Having a disability is one aspect of their life but it does not necessarily define their life and who they are as a person. It's best to understand people as people first and foremost who have a disability and to not label them according to their disability or their health condition. Myth number nine, people with disabilities cannot lead full and productive lives. People with disabilities can lead full and productive lives. The key is to focus on a person's abilities and what they are able to do and to not define them by their disability or what they're unable to do. Many people with disabilities go to school, get married, have kids, and are successful at meaningful careers. If you're not sure what I mean when I say focus on the abilities, I would like to invite you to spend five minutes Googling famous people with disabilities and learning about some of the talented people who've made their mark in history. Myth number 10. There's nothing one person can do to help eliminate barriers confronting people with disabilities. Everyone in our community has a role to play in creating an accessible and inclusive community that is welcoming of people with disabilities. And there are really easy things that you can do, like not abusing accessible parking stalls that are designated for people with disabilities. You can also become an ally who advocates for barrier-free environments in our communities. The Crippen cartoon on the bottom right makes fun of people who don't pay attention to what is accessible and what is not in our communities. It shows a man and a woman in front of a set of stairs which block the accessible path of travel. The man is seated in a wheelchair. The woman stands behind him and then patronizingly pats him on the head and says, what's the matter, dear, when she notices he's upset. He resp responds in shock and says, apart from your attitude and these barriers, you mean? There's so many things that woman could have done better at in this situation. At minimum, she could have acknowledged the barrier, suggested an alternate, more accessible route. And if she wanted to be genuinely supportive, she could have decided to become an ally and advocate for better community design. This is a, a good segue into the next slide where we're talking about the different types of barriers that are out there. When people think of barriers, they're most often thinking about the physical barriers in the built environment such as staircases, narrow pathways, and round doorknobs. These can all be significant barriers to accessing facilities for people with disabilities. That being said, there are both physical barriers and attitudinal barriers in a society that can limit the full participation of people with disabilities. At community events, we often hear that the greatest barriers that people face and continue to face are attitudinal barriers where people overlook their abilities and only focus on their disability. This can limit people's ability to get involved in their community as well as hinder their employment prospects. This all might be making you wonder, well, what can I do to make things better in my community? Um, this next slide lists a few things that we should all remember to do. Uh, we all have a role to play in overcoming attitudinal barriers and can work towards creating fully accessible and welcoming communities by remembering that 
people with disabilities are people first who happen to have a disability. We are all different and need to be recognized first for what we're capable of doing, not for what we might require assistance to accomplish. And it's important to focus on the person, not his or her disability. One of the ways that we can work towards being accessible and inclusive is by using disability friendly communication. You may be wondering, why does it matter how we communicate about disabilities and disability issues? Aren't there more important things to talk about? The truth is, is that the words we use to describe someone who has a disability are very important. Depending on what words you use, it can cause harm to a person's self-esteem or self-image, or it can enhance it. It's not just a matter of being politically correct or polite. The language we use reflects how we see and how we feel about people with disabilities. Uh, this Crippen cartoon pokes fun at this by showing all the different labels that can be put on a person undergoing medical treatment, such as burden or tragic or invalid. As part of good communication, we're working to limit these lim negative stereotypes and labels in our everyday conversation. This next slide shows some key communication tips. In general, it's best to avoid language that reinforces any stereotypes or negative images of people with disabilities. It's also best to avoid using phrases or words that are demeaning. We should also avoid using words or phrases that focus on the disability instead of the person. And it's important to avoid using language or phrases that portrays people with disabilities as a homogenous group that lacks diversity. This may leave you thinking, oh no, how do I know what to say? I'm now afraid to say anything. And well, really, what is the best way to talk about disability issues and people with disabilities? One of the ways that you can do this is by using people first language. This way of communicating recognizes that people with disabilities are people. People with disabilities are also people. We are all people first and all have different life experiences and abilities. People first language puts the person first and describes the disability as something that a person has, not who a person is. It's the difference between saying that a person has a disability versus a disabled person. It also recognizes that overly generalized terms like the disabled or the handicapped do not recognize the individuality, equality, or dignity of people with disabilities. And this slide now shows some examples of people first language. For example, the left column gives you examples of words to avoid. Usually these are words that need to be avoided because they reinforce negative stereotypes or demeaning terms. They also sometimes focus on the disability instead of the person or portray people with disabilities as a homogenous group that lacks diversity. The right hand column gives you examples of words that you can stay in set. So instead of saying crippled, say has a disability. Or instead of saying handicapped parking, you can say accessible parking. One of the easiest changes you can make is to start talking about the person first before you talk about the disability. This is as easy as saying she uses a wheelchair instead of she is wheelchair bound or saying she has a learning disability as opposed to saying she's learning disabled or saying people with disabilities instead of the disabled. As part of this presentation, I would also like to share some general tips for interacting with clients with disabilities. These are tips that are generally applicable regardless of what type of disability a client has. First and foremost, respect people's dignity and independence. This means provide services in such a way that makes people feel respected as an equal and as an independent adult. Also respect their privacy and the fact that they may not wanna talk about their disability unless they bring it up themselves. Secondly, speak and act normally. This means have a normal adult to adult conversation with people with disabilities and avoid talking down to someone or being patronizing. Third, be patient. It can take a little bit of time to get to know someone and learn about their needs. Also it can take a bit more time and energy to communicate. Just relax, go with the flow and be patient. Fourth, be understanding and open to each person's needs. Every person with disability is unique and brings their own set of abilities in areas where they would like a little bit of help. 
Don't assume anything about their disability unless they tell you. Fifth, speak directly to the person, not to their companion or attendant. Uh, this one may sound like common sense, but it can actually require some concentrated effort if you're speaking to someone that's relying on a sign language interpreter. Make sure that you're facing a person with disability and talking to them directly, not to their interpreter. Sixth, avoid touching a person's assistive aids. A person's wheelchair or guide dog is part of their personal space and belongings. Don't touch them without an invitation. And finally, remember to ask if they need help and what is the best way to help them. To be honest, if you forget everything else that I share today and remember to ask people what is the best way to help them, you'll still be doing pretty good. Generally, the best expert on how to help a person with a disability is the person with a the disability themselves because they live with it every day and have a lot of experience adapting and finding other ways of doing things. Asking is a good approach because then you don't risk assuming something that isn't true. I'm, guess, I'm going to guess that some of you participating today may have a very specific question about what to do that may be more specific to a particular type of disability. And to provide some additional information, we've also circulated a handout with some disability specific tips. You'll see that this handout provides additional information for people who are deaf and hard of hearing, people who are blind or partially sighted, people who are deafblind, people who have a physical disability or mobility related disability, people with speech disorders, people with intellectual or cognitive abilities, or cognitive disabilities, people with learning disabilities, and people with mental illnesses. There's also information provided about provincial organizations that serve these groups and can provide useful information and resources to you if you run into specific challenges. This next slide is focused on the Canadian context. The final component of my presentation is looking at the Canadian context around disability issues. My impression as a Canadian is that Canadian values tend to be welcoming and inclusive of people with disabilities. And as a society, we're working towards people with disabilities being fully included in the community with equal access to opportunities. That being said, there's still a lot of work to be done around breaking attitudinal barriers and making communities more accessible across Canada. Canadian values around disability issues are reflected in various pieces of federal and provincial legislation, which protect the rights of people with disabilities. At the federal level, the Canadian Human Rights Act prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities, and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms sets out that people with disabilities have the right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination. Within BC, the rights of people with disabilities are protected in the BC Human Rights Code. Under the code, employers, landlords, and people who provide a service to the public have a legal obligation in that they must try to accommodate the needs of people with disabilities up to the point of undue hardship. This is called the duty to accommodate. Sometimes a facility or service cannot accommodate a person's need. In that case, the service provider must prove that it would be an undue hardship to be required to do so. This next slide provides some places that you can go for further information. At some point, you might become aware of a situation where your client may need some further information about what their rights are as a, a person with a disability in Canada. To find out more or to get help, I would recommend reaching out to the BC Human Rights Clinic, which is operated by the Community Legal Assistance Society. You can also get some more information or file a complaint directly through the BC Human Rights Tribunal. And my final slide, it's just a, a thank you to all of you. Um, thanks so much for taking part in this webinar and for taking the time to learn about these issues. Um, we will have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and some of the questions that you have. I'm also happy to answer any questions that you may have at a later date. So I have included my contact information just in case something comes up after today that you'd like to reach out to us about. So, so thank you again. And I'd like to pass it over to Sabrina, who's going to introduce our next presenter. Thank you so much, Karen. Before I introduce um, our, our next speaker, I just wanted to first say thank you so much. And, and also, um, if individuals do have questions to continuously submit them and we will be taking all those questions and answering them at the Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. 
As well, the handout that you referenced can be downloaded in the handout section of the control panel, and the title of that handout is Spark BC Handout. So please feel free to download that and then save it to your devices. So moving along, I would like to introduce our next speaker of, for today, Sam Turkett. I'm the Program Director with the Disability Alliance BC. Sam is the Director of the Advocacy Access program at Disability Alliance BC. He, him and his team work with individuals to, to the individuals to access a range of services and programs available for people with disabilities including provincial disability benefits, Canada Pension Plan disability benefits, the disability tax credit and the registered disability savings plan. So thank you so much Sam for joining us today. Thanks Sabrina and thanks everyone for taking the time to be uh, with us this morning. Um, I'm going to be speaking with you about some of the uh, support programs that are available to people with disabilities in British Columbia. As Sabrina has mentioned, through our advocacy work, we provide one-to-one -one supports and services to people with disabilities to access programs, including the Provincial Persons with Disabilities designation, Canada Pension Plan Disability Benefits, the Disability Tax Credit, and the Registered Disability Savings Plan. We have a toll-free telephone line that people can use around British Columbia uh, to call and speak with an advocate about those programs and other supports that are available for people with disabilities. In addition, Disability Alliance BC has a series of help sheets and other publications that provide user-friendly information about the programs and services that we provide. The remainder of my remarks this morning are going to focus on some of the particular disability programs that are available to support people with disabilities in British Columbia. <clears throat> First, the Persons with Disabilities designation. Persons with Disabilities benefits are provided by the BC Provincial Government through the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction. This is the same ministry that provides income assistance benefits as well as a range of additional supports for people with low income and people with, uh, and people with disabilities. For example, the monthly income support rate that's available to a single person with a disability uh, through the PWD program is uh, $1,133 per month, effective October 1st, 2017. It's important to note that the Persons with Disabilities designation is an income and asset tested program. This means that the income that an individual or their family uh, receives each month or the assets that they hold uh, will determine whether or not they are eligible uh, for the Persons with Disabilities designation. Uh, in addition to meeting an income and asset test, an individual with a disability must also establish that they have a severe physical or mental health impairment, um, that they are significantly restricted in their capacity to perform daily living activities as a result of that impairment, <clears throat> and that they require some assistance from another person, an assistive device, or an assistance animal in order to receive that designation. In addition, to, provide, uh, to providing a monthly income benefit to people with disabilities, the PWD designation also uh, facilitates access to a range of other medical supports and general supplements. For example, the Ministry of Social Development uh, and Poverty Reduction can provide people with medical equipment, uh, medical supplies, uh, diet and nutritional supplements. Uh, it provides coverage for medical services plan premium assistance. Um, it provides some amount of coverage for dental benefits, um, extended medical therapies, and a range of other medical supports. In addition to the health supplements that are available through the Persons with Disabilities designation, there's also other general supplements and supports that are available. People with disabilities have access to a monthly bus pass program that can allow them to take uh, in the Metro Vancouver area, uh, TransLink buses, as well as uh, BC Transit in other communities throughout British Columbia. There's also funding available to support people with the costs of uh, moving in some situations, 
uh, to support individuals with disabilities as well as other people with low income to cover costs associated with uh, crisis circumstances uh, as well as other general supplements and supports. Uh, let's move now to, uh, we're going to transition from talking about persons with disabilities designation supports through the provincial government to some of the federal programs that are available to so support people with disabilities. The first that I'd like to provide an overview of is the Canada Pension Plan Disability Benefit. Canada Pen uh, the Canada Pension Plan is a contribution-based plan. This means that in order to be el eligible for any of the supports through Canada Pension Plan, including uh, the Disability Program, the Early Retirement Program, or CPP Retirement Benefits, that an individual must have contributed to the Canada Pension Plan um, or another Social Security Pension Plan in uh, another country that has an agreement with Canada. Um, if an individual has made the requisite contributions to the Canada Pension Plan in the past, and they acquire a severe and prolonged disability, they can apply to the Canada Pension Plan to receive a disability benefit. Uh, the amount of the benefit can range from um, about $500 per month to just about $1,300 per month, depending on the amount of contributions that an individual has made to the Canada Pension Plan in the past. Um, I should note also, that in considering whether or not a uh, individual with a disability meets the requirements for Canada Pension Plan disability benefits, um, Canada Pension Plan is going to determine whether or, not, whether or not that person's disability causes them to be substantially incapable of pursuing any kind of gainful employment and have a disability that is uh, long continued uh, or may result in their death. The next program that I'd like to talk about briefly is the Disability Tax Credit. The Disability Tax Credit is a non-refundable tax credit available to people with disabilities in Canada. Uh, by non-refundable, this means that the Disability Tax Credit can offset taxes that a family owes, uh, but will not be refunded to that family uh, if they don't require the full amount of the Disability Tax Credit to reduce their income taxes owing to zero each year. Uh, people who can be approved for the disability tax credit are those who have a market restriction in one of the listed activities of daily living. Some of the restrictions uh, that um, the Canada Revenue Agency will consider in determining whether or not a person is eligible is whether or not they have a restriction in vision, hearing, speaking, feeding, eliminating um, uh, or mental functions necessary for everyday life. In addition, if a person doesn't have a market restriction in one of those areas, it may be possible for them to qualify if they have multiple significant restrictions in more than one area or if they require life-sustaining therapy in order to manage the impacts of their disabilities. The last program that I'll talk with you about today is the Registered Disability Savings Plan. The Registered Disability Savings Plan is a long-term savings plan introduced by the federal government in 2008. In order for an individual to open up a Registered Disability Savings Plan, they must first be determined eligible for the disability tax credit. Uh, for individuals who open up a Registered Disability Savings Plan before December 31st of the year they turned 49, uh, they, uh, those people will have access to grants and bonds uh, programs uh, that are provided by the federal government. The bonds program provides an automatic con contribution to a person's registered disability savings plan up e uh, each year. The maximum bond that's available uh, is $1,000 per year. Um, and this bond is uh, primarily for people uh, who have low incomes. I think the income cutoff right now is about $26,000 uh, annual income in order to receive the full $1,000 bond. The grants program provides matching contributions uh, for individuals with low or moderate incomes. Um, for those people, the first $500 of contributions they make to their registered disability savings plan each year 
will be matched at a three to one rate um, for a total of $1,500. Uh, the next $1,000 of contributions a person with a disability makes to their registered disability savings plan will be matched at, at a two to one rate for a total of $2,000. Uh, all said, an individual could receive up to $90,000 uh, in grants and bonds over the course of their lifetime by opening up a registered disability savings plan. It's important to note that the RDSP is designed as a long-term savings plan and that any grants and bonds uh, placed in the plan must mature for at least 10 years before they can be withdrawn from the RDSP. Um, that's all I have for you today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to your questions. Um, I have intentionally provided a very, very brief overview of the programs and services that I've talked about, and I'll be very happy to, tr to try to answer specific questions if you're interested in more detail about any of these programs. Thank you very much, Sam, for your very informative presentation. Before we go to the question and answer period, we are Sabrina Ziegler, AMSA's Settlement Coordinator, and myself, Julie Shipp, AMSA's Acting Language Coordinator, would like to share key supports and resources available to settlement staff and link instructors to support clients with disabilities. Sabrina will begin with some information about the IRCC recipient guidelines provisions for disabilities section. Thank you, Julie. So IRCC has um, created a, a, a recipient guideline document that every um, organization that receives um, has a contribution agreement with IRCC um, has. And in this document, which is entitled Negotiation, Negotiating Your Contribution Agreement with Citizenship and Immigration Canada Settlement and Resettlement Programs, contains information for, for settlement organizations um, who are supporting clients with disabilities. The guidelines can be found on page 11 of this guide and include various different provisions for disability that are eligible under IRCC's funded settlement programming. So some of these costs may include provisions for equipment up to $1,000, provisions for other things such as arrangement for people with a disability, example, um, large print material or braille material, interpretation costs to support communication between deaf or hard or hearing impaired clients and recipient staff, and provisions and arrangements for items costing more than $1,000 are considered capital expenditure. As well, in the guidelines, um, in the recipient guide to your contribution agreement, Article 5.11 states where special training needs of clients with disabilities have been identified, the recipient shall submit to the department for consideration a rationale and a budget for the cost of such enhancements. So if you do have any questions regarding this recipient guidelines, um, please do speak with your settlement officer as they will be able to speak directly to your contribution agreement itself. Thank you very much, Sabrina. In all interactions with clients, the balancing act of helping and supporting all clients is a teacher and a settlement worker's continuous work. While it's true that more funding is required to bring in disability trained support workers and disability trained teaching assistants, some knowledge, knowledge and resources can help in the process. Supporting clients with disabilities in language instruction for newcomers to Canada, link programming is threefold. Accommodations may need to be made for the Canadian Language Benchmark Placement Test, the CLBPT, in the classroom and in the Portfolio Based Language Assessment, PBLA, assess assessing process. So of those three, First, I'm going to start with the CLB placement test. The CCLB, Centre for Canadian Language Benchmarks, has an assessment protocol created for the Centre for Education and Training, TCET, that may be used as an example of best practices for this purpose. You can download this document, Procedures for Assessing Clients with Disabilities, in the GoToWebinar tab. 
The key takeaway is this. Clients are provided with benchmarks for the skill areas of the assessment that they are able to complete. So this is a quote from the document, and there are a lot of other, as I said, best practices in there for placement testing. If you are a center that is remote or, and, or a center that would like to start um, assessing clients for link programming. For example, clients with disabilities uh, clients with physical disabilities are sometimes unable to do the writing portions of the CLBPT and are asked to provide responses verbally for the reading test. For partially sighted clients, eyeglasses with varying strengths are sometimes helpful. For hard of hearing clients, volumes are modified for listening tests and so on. Next, I'll talk about classrooms, but some of these uh, supports also apply to child minding spaces. For supports in classrooms and other learning environments, several supports are notable. For link clients with children with disabilities, the BC Centre for Abilities Supported Child Development Program assists families of children who require additional support to access inclusive childcare programs. For K-12, Classrooms, the Ministry of Education funds what you may have heard of as IEPs, Individualized Education Plans, while the Ministry of Advanced Education funds such supports for students in K-12 and in post-secondary institutions, as well as adult basic education, more work on expanding the Accessibility Act to include newcomer adults is underway. To support clients with vision loss, Service providers can liaise with the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. And the link to the CNIB is included in our AMSA handout. Screen readers are software programs that allow blind or visually impaired users to read text that is displayed on computer screens with a speech synthesizer or braille dis display and printer. Additionally, Listening and speaking practice using CDs, the internet, audio, online audio sources, as well as, if possible, phone calls it may seem a, a kind of an old school, but very useful with an instructor. These are some other ways to support these clients. Finally, incorporating universal design allows for better light control in communication and learning spaces. Dimmers can be a very useful thing. Some clients have vision challenges as well as ocular sensitivity to bright lights, which can impact their learning. Speech to text transcribing services can support hearing impaired clients. Clients get paired with a person who transcribes, for, for example, say lecture notes onto a computer connected to the client's computer screen. And that way, they are able to, to work with that information. Various specialized courses are also available. For example, speech reading classes are offered through various organizations, including the Western Institute for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing in Vancouver. Vancouver Community College offers a variety of courses for deaf and hard of hearing students. Programming for seniors can create a safe, inclusive place for hearing impaired clients where clients who do not have challenges uh, with hearing the instructor, for example, um, can have a space as well for their own learning. So for more information on this or acquiring uh, hearing aids, you can consult the BC Association of Speech Language Pathologists and Audiologists. For clients with mobility challenge or challenges or physical disabilities, ATBC, the Assistive Technology British Columbia, and the Neil Squire Society, which has its headquarters in Burnaby, British Columbia, offer support through the use of computer-based assistive technologies. Computer programs use voice activation assists to support clients with writing tasks, placement test taking, and potentially PBLA assessments. And the third aspect of supporting LINK clients and settlement clients 
um, is the assessment process and moving through um, the Canadian language benchmarks level. And usually this is with the goal of citizenship. Previously known as the PBLA Guide for Teachers and Programs, this new and updated web resource, PBLA Emerging Practice Guidelines 2017, incorporates new information and relevant content from Canadian Centre for Canadian Language Benchmark updates and handouts. The guidelines currently do not contain mention of supporting clients with disability through PBLA. However, quote, CCLB has a protocol for accommodate, accommodation for clients in test situations and is consulting with IRCC on how accommodations should be addressed in a PBLA environment." End quote. As Karen mentioned earlier in her presentation, Spark BC has graciously shared a handout with us that includes useful tips for interacting with and supporting clients with disabilities. You may find this Spark resource handout and the other resources we have mentioned on the GoToWebinar panel, and they will also be made, avail made available and accessible with the recording of this webinar on the AMSA website. So please stay tuned to SetNet for updates on this. So thank you, Julie. And we wanted to also um, utilize technology and, and test out a, a, a feature um, that is new to the webinar platform and share a short clip of a video with you that was taken on March 2nd during the Syrian Initiative meeting that AMSA hosted, where one of the workshops um, addressed the topic of refugees and women with disabilities. And so now we want to just briefly view this short clip from that workshop. So now we have been talking about um, persons with disabilities, but now when it comes to refugees with disabilities, refugees with disabilities face multiple barriers and they remain one of the most vulnerable groups and soci socially excluded in any displaced community. And the exclusion of, of refugees with disabilities uh, in the resettlement process happens to be an expected outcome due to environmental and communication barriers in addition to negative attitudes and stereotypes. Post arrival to Canada, the resettlement opportunities for refugees with disabilities are very limited. Uh, some of the challenges uh, faced uh, uh, by women with disabilities uh, to resettlement, uh, one, lack of a systematic adoption of women with disability um, inclusion by different key players in the settlement sector lack of data collected on the number of women with disability resettled, lack of support programs provided on women with disability awareness, both for women with disabilities and service providers, uh, and lack of uh, information about uh, Canadian law and their rights as, as uh, women with disability, and lack of English language skills. So that video that we just watched, and we will be sharing the link with everyone following the, the webinar, really was addressing the very limited post-arrival resettlement opportunities for refugees with disabilities, as well as discussed the need for spe specific disability support services for immigrant and, and refugee women with various, various disabilities. So key ideas and principal supports so find out if your organization has a disability community to reach out to with questions and extra supports. Ask if your organization supports professional development through offering workshops for staff and teachers in supporting clients with disabilities. Another um, key idea in principle is hire staff and instructors with disabilities as they can also be a major move in supporting clients with disabilities as they can share technologies and strategies required to support learners. When the time and efforts of link instructors and classroom assistants are supported, this encourages more organized and sound supports for clients. As well above all, remember you are not alone. There are many different various supports that exist. 
And just before we go into the final Q&A session, I just wanted to recap all of the different resources that are available on the handout. There are um, the IRCC recipient guidelines. As well, there is the TCET procedures for assessing clients with disabilities, the Spark BC handout, as well as the AMSA handout that can all be accessed um, in, the, in the handout session of the GoToWebinar platform. And these will also be, uh, these resources will also be made available following the, hand, the webinar. So before we go to the question and answer period, I would just like to find, make a final thank you to all of our presenters for sharing all of their information. And please feel free to submit all of your questions. You can send them um, to AMSA via events at amsa.org. Um, you can tweet us your question using the hashtag AMSA events, or you can submit your question using the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. So we have been receiving um, many questions throughout the, the webinar. And so there, there's some of the, one of the questions that is directed specifically for Sam um, is in regards to the different benefits that you mentioned when it came to federal and the provincial benefits. Um, could you please talk about um, if the federal benefits are in addition to provincial or is this instead of provincial benefits? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and the answer is it's complicated. Um, as I mentioned uh, in my remarks regarding the provincial disability designation, that is an income and asset tested designation, which means that other sources of income or assets that a person holds could affect their eligibility for benefits. And it's that income test that causes there to be a disconnect in some cases between federal supports and provincial supports. So for example, Canada Pension Plan disability benefits are deducted dollar for dollar from benefits that a person would be able to receive through the provincial disability program. Um, however, income tax benefits are exempted, which means that any supports that someone could receive through the disability tax credit, for example, uh, would not affect a person's eligibility for benefits. Um, additionally, uh, the good news respecting the registered disability savings plan is that the provincial government has enacted legislation which um, uh, allows a person to hold an RDSP and receive payments from an RDSP without an impact on their disability benefits. So this is a lot of information. I would say that the simplest way to think about this is that um, in general, uh, Canada Pension Plan disability benefits are deducted. So a person who's able to receive more through the Canada Pension Plan than they can through the provincial program would not be eligible for PWD benefits typically, while the disability tax credit and the registered disability savings plan most often will not impact a person's eligibility for either the provincial PWD program or for Canada Pension Plan disability benefits. Thank you so much, Sam. And that comes to the next question in regards to eligibility, um, particularly for immigrant and refugee um, re refugees coming to Canada. Are is this client group also eligible for these benefits? Yeah, m most often, most often the answer is going to be um, yes in regards to the provincial program. There are uh, there are certain, um, for lack of a better word requirements respecting citizenship, uh, but in our experience working one-to-one -one, um, with people with disabilities, it's not uncommon for people who uh, are permanent residents to Canada or people who have come as refugees uh, and are residing in British Columbia to be eligible for income assistance or disability assistance. Uh, the general guidance that I would provide people is when in doubt, try applying and don't hesitate to reach out to an experienced advocate if you have any difficulties accessing, accessing those programs. Um, the Canada Pension Plan Disability Benefit is a contribution-based plan, which means that individuals who have not been in Canada for an extended period of time and have not made substantial contributions to the Canada Pension Plan may not be eligible for CPP disability benefits. Um, it's important to note that there are a number of contribution sharing agreements between the Canada Pension Plan and other public pension plans around the world. Um, 
if you have an individual who has made substantial contributions to a pension plan in another country, it may be worth checking with Employment and Social Development Canada, the, the federal ministry that administers CPP disability benefits, uh, as to whether or not there is any contribution sharing agreement. Thank you so much, Sam. And we, ha we have been getting many questions regarding the content that you have shared. So I'll just continue with that and then we'll move on to some of the other questions. I didn't go into enough detail. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> so one of the questions that also came up is um, in regards to if a couple, um, if both individuals have are designated um, persons with disability, how, how does that affect their, their monthly benefits? Yeah, um, another very good question. You guys are you guys are really hitting all the highlights here. Um, eligibility for provincial disability benefits is based not on the circumstances of the individual with a disability, but that that person's family unit. That family unit is going to include the individual, their spouse, and any de and any dependent children who they have. Um, Generally speaking, there's two effects that uh, having a larger family is gonna have on eligibility for benefits. Larger families are eligible for a larger monthly benefit. So when I talk about 1133 being the maximum benefit for a single person, it's important to remember that families that consist of um, two people or families that uh, consist of two people with children will be eligible for more than that $1,133 per month. Um, it's possible for uh, an individual and their spouse both to be designated as a person with a disability um, and uh, that family, uh, a family with two people with disabilities, would receive more than a family with one person with a disability and would also receive more than one person with a disability and a spouse without a disability. It's also important to remember that in determining eligibility of the family unit, the ministry is going to be considering the income and assets held, not just by the person with a disability, but also income and assets received by their spouse uh, and possibly also um, income received by their children. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, one of the questions that has come up a few times is you mentioned under the RDSP, you mentioned two different years. You mentioned the age of 49 and 59. If you could maybe just clarify that again. Yeah, very happy to do that. Um, technically, a person can open an RDSP up until December 31st of the year that they turn 59. But you'll recall that I spent some time talking about the grants and bonds program. Um, and individuals can only receive grants and bonds through their RDSP until December 31st, they turn 49. You'll also remember that I had mentioned that grants and bonds need to mature for 10 years uh, before they can be withdrawn from an RDSP without penalty. Now note the 10 year differential between uh, the point at which someone ceases to be eligible uh, after they turn 50 uh, and the point at which they cease to be eligible to open an RDSP um, by December 31st, the year that they turn 59. Thank you so much. And you also mentioned um, the advocacy work that that you do with your organization. Does, does Is that a provincial mandate or is that only for organizations in Metro Vancouver? Um, we are a provincially mandated organization but the scope of support that we can provide to people depends on the type of help that they're looking for and whether or not they're able to meet with us directly in the office. So for example, um, individuals who have any questions about disability benefits or other supports for people with disabilities, uh, I would strongly encourage to contact us through our 1-800 telephone line. Um, some of the supports that we offer, that we offer can be provided to people anywhere in the province, where, uh, whereas in some cases we may need to require that a person meet with us directly in our office to be able to provide the kind of one-to-one -one, um, support that we, that we offer. 
So in, in short, I would uh, encourage you to direct questions to us through our provincial telephone line and we'll do our very best um, to provide the supports that we're able to, regardless of what, whether or not you're in the Lower Mainland or in another community in British Columbia. Thank you so much for, for clarifying that. And it's good to know that um, individuals and organizations can contact you. And then if you're not able to, to support them, you'll make those referrals to other Absolutely. organizations. Absolutely. Perfect. And so another question that came up um, is in regards to individuals um, who are designated person with disability. Are they able to earn monthly income as well that wouldn't uh, affect their, their benefits? Um. So many great questions. Um, so the ministry has different rules respecting uh, income that a person receives. Um, and the, the way that they divide treatment of income is they talk about unearned income and earned income. Unearned income, is, well, I should start with earned income. Earned income, for the most part, is money that someone receives from employment. Um, and that is subject to an annualized earnings exemption. For a long time, the amount of the annualized earnings exemption was $9,600 per year for a single person. Um, actually, in the most recent uh, budget update, the government has just uh, announced an increase to that um, annual earnings exemption. It's gonna be going up to $12,000 per year for a single person. This means that a person who's receiving PWD benefits could work and earn income from employment up to a total of $12,000 per year um, without a reduction in the amount of the monthly benefits that they receive through the PWD designation. Now, on the other hand, unearned income, uh, we can think of generally as any income that is not within that earned income category. So there we talk about money people receive from Canada Pension Plan Disability Benefits, Employment Insurance Benefits, um, WCB, uh, and other support programs. And the general rule with respect to unearned income is that it's deducted dollar for dollar from a person's monthly benefits unless there's a specific exemption listed in the Act. Uh, or I should say in the in the applicable regulations. Now it turns out that there are some important exemptions um, to unearned income. Uh, for example, uh, gifts and inheritances are exempt income. So this means that an individual with PWD benefits can receive gifts or inheritances from family members without having an impact on their monthly benefits. Thank you so much, Sam. I think we're going to we're going to there's still some more questions regarding to the content that, that you have provided. But I think we're going to move over to some of the more general questions that um, that we will be that are that we've been receiving. And one um, question that we received from a, a settlement worker is that they currently ha are supporting a refugee client who has a disability and they're looking to, to support that client in getting a driver's license. Um, how is there an organization where they can seek additional support in, in that process or do you have any suggestions? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, did they mention what type of disability it was? No. Okay, okay. So what I would recommend is if you're aware of the specific type of disability, it's good to connect with the organization that serves that type of disability um, because they would know how um, other people have gone around the process of applying for a driver's license and what types of assistance and supports are available. So for example, if you had a client who uses a wheelchair, um, one organization that you might want to reach out to would be Spinal Cord Injury BC um, because they would be aware of all the various supports that are available, the types of assistive technology that's available for, for vehicles and could help walk them through what's available and what the steps are that they need to take. Um, so when in doubt, I would start with the disability specific organization and get your help there and, and, and go from there. Thanks so much, Karen. I think that's a really good tip is to really go to that specific organization and then they probably have worked with other individuals who, who, who've gone through the same thing in the past. Um, another question that we've received from a settlement worker is they're looking to support a client who has a hearing disability 
um, and they're looking to support this client in, uh, in completing their citizenship test to become a Canadian citizen. Mm -hmm. However, this individual does have a low literacy level in their original language as well as in, AS, as in ASL. Okay. And so um, if there's any supports or if there's any exemptions that you, that you know of um, mm -hmm. and how, how this settlement worker could support that client. Oh, that's a that's an interesting question, and and maybe um, Julie and Sabrina, you might also have some thoughts on this as well, based on your knowledge of the types of accommodation supports people have received through this process previously. Um, I would recommend reaching out to the Western Institute for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing and find out what types of technology and supports they may be able to provide, and what types of accommodations um, they they might be able to to recommend um, and I think that would be a really good starting point for for figuring out the best way forward um, but Sabrina and Julie do you have any thoughts that you want to add based on the the guidelines so I wouldn't for I, I don't have any additional thoughts based on the on the guidelines that I'm aware of however I do want to encourage um, organizations if they have very specific questions to also be in touch with their IRCC settlement officer mm -hmm. as they will be the individual who can really contact um, the department and, and seek really specific additional information to, to a very specific case so feel free to, to really reach out to your settlement officer because there may be um, based on the IRCC recipient guidelines, there may be some additional support that, that could be provided, um, but that's going to be very specific. And your settlement officer would be the one who, who would be able to, to assist you with that. So another question, um, and this could be either for, for you, Karen, or for, for you, Sam. Mm -hmm. What do you, what is your take, um, what do you think about the ethics of asking settlement clients upon intake to disclose hidden disabilities when direct supports may or may not necessarily always be available? Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, you could always put a question, like say if you do an intake survey of, um, you know, please let us know if, if you have any accessibility um, accommodation requests or any accessibility support requests and we will do our best to help you. Um, and then that kind of gives them the option of deciding whether or not they want to disclose. Um, but we do that in, in a lot of different contexts. So sometimes as part of our work at Spark BC, we plan uh, public engagement events where we're seeking the participation of people with disabilities um, and a broad range of disabilities. And so quite often when we do our um, registration process, we'll have a question about that so that people have an opportunity to identify if they need a sign language interpreter or if they need some transportation supports or that sort of thing. So it gives people an opportunity to, to self-identify and to share what kind of needs they might have. Um, I do understand that it might be a little bit tricky if you're worried that the needs might be greater than the available funding or the available resources. Um, but I also think that the first step is identifying what the need is because sometimes the accommodations can be super, super easy. Like sometimes it's as simple as providing redundant information. Like if you're going to be describing something orally, it's also providing that information in written format. Like some accommodation supports don't really require any financial resources and sometimes there might actually be resources and supports um, through other organizations that you've listed in the handout so even if you're not necessarily aware off the top of your head what's available there might be something out there that can that can help people and um, and sometimes too with nonprofit organizations um, even if they do charge a fee for a particular service um, sometimes there can also be hardship assistance so I think I, I would encourage all the settlement workers and all the people who are serving um, uh, new immigrants and refugees across BC to reach out to these organizations and just say, you know, I know this person has this particular um, barrier and then I'm thinking that there may be something that might help them. We don't currently have any resources out there. Do you know of a place where they might be able to access some financial support for that? 
and um, quite often it can be really powerful how a lot of um, different communities of people with disabilities will kind of pitch in and help and support one another. And, and you'll see that um, in other contexts too, like for example, with the wild, wildfires across BC, um, I was noticing a lot of information on social media about different groups that were trying to reach out and help people with similar types of disabilities in the affected communities. Um, so you might be surprised at what's available if you ask. And if you don't ask, you're not going to know what's available. And if it's not available and there's a real need, I think there's an important advocacy role that you guys can play as, as frontline workers in terms of letting um, different levels of government know what some of the needs are and the fact that you guys would need funding for those types of supports. Um, so that's a bit of a long-winded answer, but I, I don't know if Sam has anything he'd like to, to add to that or... Um, um, to, to echo um, Karen's sentiments, I think when it comes to um, inviting people to disclose hidden disabilities, uh, I think that it is uh, useful and can be helpful to provide people with an opportunity to disclose a disability. Um, however, I think that you need to balance that against people's interests in their own privacy mm -hmm. and the fact that people may not be comfortable um, or feel that they've developed the kind of trust relationship with you um, to want to disclose a hidden disability. Um, it's also really important to remember the context in which you're working with a person. So for example, we know um, working at Disability Alliance BC that when people come in to see us, they come in anticipating getting help with, for example, disability applications. And I think that the kind of conversations that are appropriate uh, about a person's disability in that context is very different from the kinds of conversations that are appropriate about a person's disability in more general social mm -hmm. contexts or even in other support relationships. Thank you so much. I think that that's something that um, individuals were, the challenge is to know, should I ask somebody to disclose something or not? So um, another question that has, has come from an individual who assists tenants in BC, um, and it's, it's in regards to language. Mm -hmm. And Karen, that you, you mentioned using respectful terms. Mm -hmm. However, um, the person, um, when they're looking to support um, a client who has a disability, get housing, they, they've noticed that that person often, often refers to themselves in a term that you had listed on the list that we shouldn't be using. <laughs> and so um, the question is, do I mirror the language they use? Do I, um, do I confirm the information? Do I do a general term and say, I understand you are a person with disability? Um, what suggestions do you have? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say that when you're speaking yourself, it's probably best to use the most respectful language. Um, that being said, I don't think you should ever feel like you have to correct a person with a disability about how they want to, to describe themselves. At, at the end of the day, um, if a person's talking about themselves, they can really describe it whatever way they would like. So, for example, for um, Spark Runs, the Accessible Parking Permit Program, and um, I frequently have clients who call me up and talk about handicap parking. So I don't, I don't stop and correct them and say, well, actually, we refer to it as accessible parking. Um, I just kind of go along with the conversation. But when I'm representing my organization and when I'm responding to questions, um, I never say handicap parking unless <laughs> you're encountering a real communication breakdown. <laughs> so so if, uh, if I'm talking to someone who maybe has limited understanding of something and or experience with it, and I can tell they don't know what I'm talking about with accessible parking, and I can tell they they don't understand what I mean when I'm talking about designated parking for people with disabilities, that eventually I might try and pull out one of these terms just to, to make to make the connection. But uh, I think in general, it's always best to model your own language and your own communication um, using respectful terms and um, whether or not they choose to mirror you as they 
become more comfortable and more um, settled in, in Canada, that that's completely their choice. Um, Sam, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Or? Um, I mean, it, it's so important to keep in mind that there's no reason to expect that people with disabilities will necessarily be experts in disability theory. Mm -hmm. um, one idea that we think a lot about, that people who support people with disabilities think a lot about, is this idea of accommodation. And I would put to you that allowing for the different kinds of language that people use to describe their own disability is even a very small form of accommodation in its own right, where you have to make allowances for the fact that um, some people with disabilities will not use sort of the most current or accepted language around communicating about um, their own disability. Uh, I, I agree with Karen um, that best practices in, in most instances are probably to use the most appropriate or accepted language, um, but that it may become necessary, depending on the sophistication of the individual that you're communicating with, to make small accommodations by mirroring the language that they use, just to make it a little bit easier for them to um, interact with you. It's really a context sensitive kind of thing, um, depending on the particular um, capabilities of the individual you're working with. Thank you so much. I think that just really encouraging individuals in terms of the language usage. And as, as you said um, earlier, you know, just to, to ask that individual how they would like to be referred to as well. That was the one thing that you, that you mentioned earlier, Karen, that if, we, that if that's our one takeaway for today, then we've, you know, we've, we've learned a lot. Um, so I want to come to our final question, and we, I do want to acknowledge that we have received many questions. However, we are um, we um, haven't been able to answer them all due to time limitations. However, um, we at AMSA we are we um, we will try and find answers to the many questions that you have submitted to us, and we will either be looking to um, seek. Uh, Karen and, and Sam's assistance further, or we will. Um, some of them are more general that questions where we may need to consult with um, IRCC. But we will be looking to, to compose, compile all these questions together, and we will be sending out some information following the webinar um, to everyone who's registered, so that everyone has the same answers to, to these questions. But one of the the final question that has come up is, um, individuals have noticed in a real um, overlap when it comes to supporting clients with disability in terms of the settlement and language sector as well as um, specific organizations that provide services to very specific um, individuals with a disability. Um, what are some suggestions or ways how both sectors could more closely work together and, and work to, to support um, clients who have disability regardless if they're if there are Canadians who've been here for a longer time or immigrants and refugees? Hmm, that's a really thoughtful question. Um, so just to make sure that I've understand the question correctly, um, are they concerned about duplication of services or, or confusion? They're when? looking more in terms of how can we support and, and really, um, you know, seek positive change together as both the immigrant and ref and and settlement and language sector, okay. um, as well as the, the disability alliance sector. Right, right. Um, what I would encourage um, um, people who work um, within this sector to do is to reach out to other sectors that have aligned goals and objectives. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if we're all working towards more accessible and inclusive communities and providing people with access to services that they need, um, it's wonderful if you can make connections with, with service providers in your community and learn more about what they provide and, and how you can help them. Um, there's also a broad range of ways that you could get involved in more, more advocacy efforts. So, for example, um, one of the things that SparkBC does is we 
um, helped to support and facilitate a Provincial Access Awareness Day campaign on the first Saturday of June each year. Um, so if a particular organization wanted to get involved in raising awareness about disability issues, and particularly about issues that their clients are experiencing, they could always reach out to Spark about, well, how do we get involved in Access Awareness Day this year? You know, we'd like to do something. Um, so a lot will just depend on the particular community context and what you guys are trying to accomplish and what the identified needs are. But um, I think that um, both sectors are probably always looking for allies and people who are looking to create communities that are more welcoming and inclusive. And there can be some tremendous opportunities with that. So don't hesitate to reach out and make new friends. I'll, I'll take a very um, slightly diff different approach to answering this question, um, which is to say, one thing that I think about um, when supporting individuals with disabilities um, who have come to Canada uh, as immigrants or refugees is that it's important to think about um, the way that their experience uh, as immigrants or refugee refugees may inform their experience as a person with a disability and also vice versa, you know, the ways mm -hmm. in which their own disabilities might have affected their experiences in coming to Canada. So, for example, when we work with clients who are newcomers to Canada um, and are trying to understand their disabilities, often it's helpful to put that um, information into the context around uh, how they came to Canada in the first place. Um, you need to be prepared um, for the fact that um, many individuals who have come as refugees may have come from um, traumatizing experiences, mm. um, that the process of adapting to a new culture um, and a new country um, can come with its own mental health challenges, that people may have acquired um, physical disabilities, um, which could have informed um, the basis on which they've come to Canada in the first place. And that thinking about those kinds of common experiences and overlap is a really useful way um, to both think about um, the disability experience as well as the immigrant and refugee experience. There's a lot we can learn from each other for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you to, to both of you, um, Sam and Karen, and also thank you to, to Julie and, and Khan for, su for supporting and making this webinar possible. And also thank you, um, everyone who was listening and joining and submitting your questions. Um, it was a really engaging, fruitful webinar. And um, as I mentioned, we will be looking to, to um, answer all those questions that we have received that we haven't been able to answer throughout the webinar. We will also be sharing and sending out all the handouts that we have um, posted here on, um, on the control panel, as well as the link to the video that we sh um, shared throughout the webinar. Um, we will also be sending in that email an online evaluation link, and so we please ask that you take the time to fill in that link, as AMSA really relies on the feedback that we receive in our evaluations to, to plan our, our future events and trainings. And so thank you once again to, to our speakers and to the AMSA team, and we would also like to acknowledge and thank Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, IRCC, for funding today's event. We will be posting everything as well, um, recording of the webinar and, and all the additional handouts and resources on the AMSA website, and a notification will be sent out on SETNET once everything is online. So please um, feel free and go to our website to sign up. Thank you for everyone for joining us today. Goodbye.